Hi, this is David Hillier here and I'm going to give you a quick video on the cost of capital and in particular I'll be focusing on how we differentiate between a firm level cost of capital and a project cost of capital and the situations when we should use one or the other. It's a bit of a practical uh, video this one and uh, I'll be giving you some insights before my next video where we'll be using real data to estimate the cost of capital of a company. So we'll start off with, with an example here. Uh, I think it's a good example. So what we're doing is we're, we're, we're comparing the firm level versus the project level cost of capital. So you've got a publishing firm. So a publishing firm is in a specific industry and is looking at an investment in the software industry. It's a different industry. Now, we know from this example that software companies have high betas and uh, the betas are definitely higher than uh, in publishing. And that would then tell us that the cost of capital for software projects should be higher than the cost of capital for publishing projects. So what should the company do then? Well, you've got two choices. One is that uh, you take the firm level uh, cost of capital, that's a cost of capital that the company has always used. Or you maybe take a different cost of capital, potentially a software industry uh, cost of capital. And, and that's really the decision that a financial manager must make. Uh, you know, a financial manager will be used to assessing the viability of projects within his or her own industry. But when you have to move outside your industry, you have less experience. So you have to think, well, do we go with what we always use in our own company or do we start maybe extending uh, the analysis? And you you can have two choices here. One is, as you can say, well, let's look at um, the betas of a software, um, the software index. What's the average beta um, in a software industry? Or alternatively, you can even go even further than that and say, well, okay, let, let's just talk about the software industry. So you could have big software companies um, that are, are existing and, and they are listed. So you could look at their prices. But then a company in itself is going to be lower risk than a new startup investment. So you might have to actually say, well, okay, we're not going to use the publishing beta, we're going to use a software industry beta. But then given that this is a startup investment or a new investment or a greenfield investment, then we're going to increase the beta ourselves um, to reflect the increased risk. Now, that is a very subjective um, approach, but ultimately that's what a financial manager must do. You're, you're operating in, in, you know, a, you know, choppy water that you know there is no certainty here and you can do an awful lot of analysis but ultimately it comes down to predicting it comes down to you know estimating things that you're uncertain about and most uh, financial managers I know if they are operating in a different sector they will you know they will take a, the industry um, beta they will make an adjustment to that based on their expectation of whether the 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 project is riskier or less risky than that uh, industry beta. So uh, that that's that's what we, we are considering now. Now, we need to be really careful uh, with this decision because if you've got a company that has a low beta uh, and you're investing in an, an industry that has a higher beta, then if you use the company uh, beta to arrive at a cost of capital, then you're, you're going to make the wrong decisions and the wrong recommendations from your analysis. And I have a graph here. Uh, so let's assume that we've got the hurdle rate, a company's hurdle rate. Now that's just basically the, the cost of capital for the company. And many companies just use one rate, uh, irrespective of the projects they, they're involved in. Um, that you might say, well, and I would say, well, that's wrong. But companies do it. Uh, a lot of companies do that in practice, even very large companies. So let's just assume that a company has a hurdle rate. It's the, the company's cost of capital. And we compare that with um, a, 
you know, a, an extension to the model where we we have a different cost of capital depending on the risk of the project. So looking at this line here, this black line, you're seeing the company's cost of capital there. Now, you accept the project if the return on the project is above the cost of capital. That's like the internal rate of return. And so if you use the company's cost of capital, you would accept this project. Uh, which is a high risk, and you would reject this project, which is a low risk. However, if you use the the CAPM, and in this case we're using CAPM, uh, you see that you've got the risk-free rate, and then you have the beta, and it's a linear relationship, then you then have a different expected return on an investment, a different cost of capital, depending on the risk of the project. And this is a low risk project, and you can see here that the expected return on that project should be down below that. So if you're using CAPM, the correct approach, you would accept that project. Whereas if you use a company cost of capital, you would reject the project. Similarly, uh, in this case, you've got a very high risk project and the CAPM would predict that the, the cost of capital should be uh, at this point here, uh, which is above the, the return. So you would reject this project if you use the cost of capital. However, if you use the firm cost of capital, you would accept it. So you can see that you're getting different outcomes um, when you just use a, a corporate cost of capital. And that's what you need to be very careful about. So we, we've talked about cost of capital. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about cost of capital with debt. And I'm going to introduce the, formally uh, the concept, the uh, after-tax weighted average cost of capital. So let's let's start off by assuming that uh, a company's got both debt and equity in its capital structure, and the cost of debt is we have here is R B, and the cost of equity is R S. So you ask, well, what is the overall or the average cost of capital here? Now we are using the after-tax cost of capital. Now, why we, do we do that? Well, to an investor, you're seeing, and, and it really is, is, you know, the cost of capital to a manager is the return that an investor expects. And uh, the cost of capital uh, or the cost of debt, because you're paying interest uh, and that intre those interest payments reduce the profit, which in turn reduces the tax bill. So therefore, the actual cost of debt or the after-tax cost of debt is cheaper because you've got that reduction in uh, profit and tax uh, coming from the interest payments that, that are, are being paid regularly. So we, we always use the after-tax cost of debt. And so what you see here is you see the cost of equity. Now, the cost of equity is the cost of equity because there isn't, the dividend payments come after you've worked out the tax. But the, the cost of debt, because you pay coupons, you pay interest before you work out the tax, then you have to uh, reduce it by one minus the corporate tax rate. And I'll go into this in a lot more detail in a later chapter. I'm just wanting to, to introduce you to this concept just now. And each of uh, these uh, weights, that's just a proportion. And, and these are market values, the proportion of equity and the proportion of debt that makes up the company's capital structure. So I'll just emphasize, these are market values rather than uh, book values. However, in many countries, in many environments, because debt isn't traded often, then as practitioners, we tend to use just the, the book value of debt because that is as close as an estimate to the market value of debt as you can get. So we call this formula the weighted average cost of capital. That's the cost of equity, the RS. That's the cost of debt, the RB. That's the after-tax cost of debt, the RB times 1 minus the corporate tax rate. And these are weights of equity and debt in the capital structure. So this is a weighted average cost of capital. So let's look at an example here. Uh, we're going to look at a company called Dorcella Mittal. Uh, it's a steel maker, and uh, this company is a very large company. It's a very large European company. It has um, debt uh, that's worth 4.4 billion euros and equity that is worth 71.4 billion euros. So clearly, 
the equity dominates the debt and um, the weighting of equity is going to take up a much larger part of this company's capital structure. Uh, in terms of the debt that Archila Metal has, um, the interest payments that are, are paid every year are 6%. Uh, in terms of the equity, um, the, the equity has a beta of 1.81. And the effective tax rate for Archila Metal is 13.1%. Now, that is because Archila Metal is a multinational, so it's operating in many d different jurisdictions. And so, therefore, the, the average tax rate is an average of all the different uh, tax rates that uh, the company uh, has, to, has to, to bear. In terms of the equity, uh, we're assuming that CAPM uh, works. So we need the risk-free rate and we need the market risk premium in addition to the beta, which we've already stated is 1.81%. So let's assume that uh, the market risk premium is 9.5% and the risk-free rate, or the Treasury bill rate, is 4.5%. So we're now going to try and calculate the weighted average cost of capital. So let's just remember what we need here. We need the, the, the weightings of the equity and the debt in the capital structure. We need the cost of equity, so we're going to have to use CAPM. And we need the after-tax cost of debt. So that's the, what we're going to do for the weighted average cost of capital. So let's do the, the debt first. So the cost of debt, uh, the pre-tax cost of debt is 6%. Um, we, we wrote that here and uh, you see 6%. Um, the tax rate is 13.1%. So the after-tax cost of debt is 6% times 1 minus 0.131, which is equal to 5.214%. We now do the cost of equity. And now you can see that uh, the formula here is a CAPM formula. Uh, the risk-free rate is 4.5%. The market risk premium is 9.5%. And the beta is 1.81. So using CAPM, we end up with a cost of equity of 21695 so the next thing is now the weights. Uh, the total value, the total market value of the company uh, is the sum of the debt and the equity. And that comes out to be 75.8 billion euros. We want to find the proportions of the debt and equity. So it's, you know, we have 5.8% uh, for the debt. Now, how do you get that? Well, it's just 44 divided by 75.8. And that gives you 5.8%, so that's the weight of the debt. And the weight of the equity is just 1 minus 5.8, or you can do the divide 71.4 billion by 75.8 billion. And that gives us 94.2%. So we now have everything that we need to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. Uh, I've just reprinted this from my book. So we have the weight, uh, in fact, this is the other way around. So the weight of the equity is 71.4 divided by 75.8 multiplied by the cost of capital uh, or cost of equity capital. Uh, the weight of the debt multiplied by the after-tax cost of debt. And that gives us a weighted average cost of capital for ArcelorMittal of 20.738%. And that's what we use when we are going to look at projects and evaluate projects for Archila Metal that are in the industry that Archila Metal is operating in. And you can just see uh, the table here uh, showing you this. Um, so you have the market values here, the total value of the company, you have the weights which is just 4.4 divided by 75.8, 71.4 divided by 75.8. We have the after-tax uh, cost of capital in each of these. Uh, you notice that, that uh, the equity cost of capital is the CAPM. That gives us the, the cost of uh, the weighted cost of capital, and then you just add these together to get the weighted average cost of capital. So let's go on to another project uh, or another example. In this case, we have a company that's got a debt to equity ratio of 0.6. Uh, the cost of debt is very high for this company. It's 15.15%. Uh, 
uh, the cost of equity is 20%, it's higher because it's riskier, uh, and the tax rate is 34%. So you're asked, well, what is the weighted average cost of capital in this? Now, you're going to calculate the weighted average cost of capital, and then you're going to use that uh, in an NPV analysis. And that, the weighted average cost of capital is effectively the discount rate that you use in the NPV analysis. The project that you're considering costs £50 million, pounds, and it's going to give you savings of £12 million pounds a year for six years. Now, that's an annuity. So it's a fairly straightforward um, task to use um, our annuity formula to arrive at the present value of those cost savings and then we just net them out to get the net present value. So let's start off then. Now the first thing I want you to, to think about is we have a debt to equity ratio of 0.6. So that means that you have 6 parts debt to every 10 parts of equity. So in total there are 16 parts. 6 parts of debt to 10 parts of equity. So in total there are 6 plus 10 parts in the company. And that is the debt equity ratio. We're wanting to find the, the weight of the debt and the weight of the equity in the, the, um, the overall capital structure of the company. So if the debt to equity ratio is 0.6, that means there are six parts of debt, six parts of equity. That should be a B here. Uh, so that would be six divided by six plus 10, which is uh, six divided by 16. In that case, uh, you've got uh, 6 divided by 16 is equal to 0.375. We've got the, if, that's, if the weight of the debt is 0.375, then it means that the weight of the equity must be 1 minus 0.375, which is equal to 0.625. So let's just see. We're looking at the weights. The weight of debt to equity is 0.6, so that's 6 over 10. So in total, there are 16 parts. So the debt to total value ratio is 6 divided by 10, 6 plus 10, and in that case, it's 0.375. The cost of equity is 20%, and the cost of debt is 15.15%. And we have a tax rate of 0.34, so uh, 1 minus the tax rate is 0.66. So that gives us a weighted average cost of capital of 16.25%. And that's what we use in the discount rate. Uh, we have an initial investment of 50 million. We have a six-year annuity, where the discount rate is 16.25%. That gives us a value, or a net present value, of minus 6.07. So using the weighted average cost of capital, you would not accept this project because the NPV is equal to, uh, is less than zero. So in this video, I've taken you through uh, explaining uh, the weighted average cost of capital. I've also discussed the differences between firm level projects um, or firm uh, projects that are consistent with the what the company normally does against projects that are maybe outside the company's sphere of influence and I've shown you how you would approach these uh, in terms of working out the weighted average cost of capital and the discount rate for these projects. Okay so thank you very much and uh, I'll see you again.